You're listening to the Autism Weekly Podcast. Each week, we share community voices and bring light to stories that increase awareness, acceptance, equity, access, and inclusion. If you haven't already, subscribe to join the Autism Weekly family. I'm your host, Jeff Skavitsky. This week, we're joined by Ling Li Tan, CEO of Lingo, and Jane Button, who are bringing their expertise in the field of behavior analysis. Drawing on Ling's 18 years of experience in delivering behavioral interventions for people with autism and developmental disabilities, and Jane's qualifications as a BCBA, they're here to discuss innovative approaches to treatment, from AAC implementation to lingo-assistive technology that supports the learning of language, speech, communication, and literacy skills. Ling, Jane, welcome to the podcast. It's great to be here. Thank you for inviting us. Now it's it's my pleasure. And and one thing that I'd love to be able to do initially is is just to allow the audience to get to know you all by giving a background, letting us know the story and the journey, because the field of autism also often brings people who have passion to the field. And it's it's such a service delivery uh, oriented field that everybody's got their story. So maybe Ling, you can give us a little background and Jane afterwards about, you know, how you took your clinical experience and why it moved into speech and language. Sure, uh, I can get started. Uh, well, I started um, working with children with autism about 20 years ago. I was uh, trained by one of the first board certified behavior analysts in Canada. There were about like six or seven at the time. and. Uh, back then, there wasn't really an education program. I had an undergrad in, uh, I was getting my undergrad in psychology, and I was approached uh, to babysit a boy with autism, and he was uh, undergoing uh, ABA therapy, and I was asked if I wanted to become a BC, or just be trained uh, by this BCBA, and so I'm like, oh, sure, I have no idea what ABA was at that time. And I was trained uh, in the approach of uh, analysis of verbal behavior. Uh, a lot of my training was, uh, my BCB was trained from the Carbone Clinic, so uh, Vincent Carbone. And so a lot of my uh, teaching approaches were based on, uh, on his approach. And so this little boy was not speaking at the time. And I was being trained by this BCBA, who was incredible. Uh, taught me a lot of skills and the team as well. And within three months, he was learning to speak. He was communicating. And at that moment, I knew that uh, that I wanted to become a BCBA. That was my my career path. So along the journey, um, you know, this is Ontario, Canada, where there is a lot of funding constraints for autistic children. I found that. Uh, uh, resources were limited for many of these kids. The majority of the kids that I worked with were non like not speaking, minimally minimally verbal and found that a lot of the speech generating devices were difficult for them to use. And it was an unfair advantage because there was um, some stipulations put on these children to make a certain amount of progress within a, a certain time frame like 6 months, but it was it was really challenging for them to progress and so that led me to think about how can we create a communication system that will allow them to progress and advance their language so that they could continue with their funding. Um, I mean, if they, their funding was discontinued, if they weren't making progress, there was a lot more pressure for, for me to think of solutions on how to improve their like tacting and interverbal skills across the VB map. So, uh, so that led me to think a lot about how do we construct a, an AC system. I mean, I, there's uh, at least 60% abandon their device within the first year. So there's a big problem in this field when it comes down to AAC implementation and training. But that was my journey and that's how I got started. Um, since then, I've, I'm a BCBA and Ontario Autism Program Clinical Supervisor. My background is uh, heavily in, in naturalistic developmental behavioral interventions. I'm an ESDM therapist and certified PRT as well. So learning language and communication is, is a big uh, passion of mine. Yeah, I mean, that one piece that you mentioned there about the fact that when we originally created a lot of these communication systems, they were almost harder to do and the effort to be able to put forward made it so that why would a child be invested through the process? Because even as adults, if I have to click more than three buttons on a web page, I'm done. So yeah. I, I love when we get into it a little bit deeper to understand how you made this process more user friendly and so that children could actually attach to it. But Jane, can you give us a little bit of background about your experience? 
Sure. Thanks so much, Jeff. I actually am pretty similar to Ling where I got started in the field when I was a psychology student, was planning to become a psychologist. And I met a little girl in my community who absolutely inspired me. Um, she was autistic and she had a fantastic team who was helping her to meet her potential. And I got to see firsthand how quickly she was able to learn with the support of applied behavior analysis. And I said, okay, this is what I wanna do. This is what I want to dedicate my life and my career to. And um, so I had the privilege of working um, very early in my career, actually my first internship as a student was at a regional treatment center that took a multidisciplinary approach. So from day one, I was working not only with BCBAs, but also occupational therapists and speech language pathologists. And I remember very clearly going to my first IEP meeting and walking into a room of 25 individuals for one student, one, uh, one student who was in kindergarten at the time. And I thought, wow, all of this for one student with, with one objective um, that we're all trying to commonly meet. And it was from that point that I realized that autism is so complex and it does require the understanding and the expertise of so many different professionals and schools of thought and education. Um, and so I've always been fascinated by bringing uh, to, to the table from a, a behavior analytic point of view, bringing to the table that knowledge uh, when it comes to ABA, but also really collaborating with the other professionals and where they come from and, and where their expertise and knowledge is. I think that's such a beautiful collaboration when we have the opportunity. So uh, that, yeah, that's, that's kind of where my career started, but um, it took a turn when I, when I was introduced to Lingo and uh, I was introduced very organically when um, I, had, I had gone to a mentor of mine who was both a speech language pathologist and a behavior analyst. And I was struggling uh, with my caseload uh, for individuals who were complex, uh, had complex communication needs. And those were mostly non-vocal or minimally vocal individuals. And um, I could see the potential that they had and we were making progress on their uh, different communication language and social skills, but I didn't feel like we were meeting them quickly enough. Um, I felt that it could go a lot further. And um, at the time during the pandemic in particular, when I was working in family homes, I could see how much of a burden it was for families to be almost case managers and service coordinators bringing AAC systems into their lives. So um, I was introduced to Lingo and I absolutely loved the design of the system and the mission to make communication accessible for individuals who need it. So that's how I came into Lingo. And you know, our work is um, is going strong now and we've got a lot to do to get to our mission, but um, that's absolutely at the heart of what we do every single day. Well, I applaud the interdisciplinary work that you've, that you've done. It's I think that the ability to learn from different fields is what makes a wonderful clinician over time. And maybe Ling, this is a question for you is that when you were when you were really diving deep into AAC implementation, as the school of thoughts have changed over time, is that I mean, when we're talking about communication styles, is that you have vocal, you have sign language, and then you have the group that falls within AAC. So maybe you can give a little bit of background on where AAC fits within the scheme of communication and maybe how they all kind of intersect over time as well. Yes, uh, so AAC augmented, it stands for Augmentative and Alternative Communication. So we all use forms of AAC every day. Um, texting is a form of AAC. Anything you do um, uh, without speaking to communicate is a form of AAC. So sign language is a formal a uh, unaided AAC system. Using a gesture is an unaided form of AAC. Uh, so in terms of intersectionality, we all use forms of AAC. However, uh, for those with autism, about 20 to 25 to 50% have very little to no functional speech. So they will require a form of AAC use. And uh, from there, you know, we'll have, it's important to work as a multidisciplinary team, like work with a speech language pathologist to run an assessment on a person who requires AAC to communicate and then uh, look at the different types of devices or systems out there that would best serve their needs based on their learning style or not necessarily learning style, but how they learn, like uh, doing an assessment, how they learn and how they pick their, um, uh, implement their device to use their device to communicate. 
No, and, and that makes that makes a ton of sense. And it also makes sense that you'd have to be able to draw off of a variety of assessments. And I mean, whether it's a speech pathologist bringing an occupational therapy, uh, occupational therapist bringing in a physical therapist to understand limitations to what somebody's capable of doing. I think that all of that kind of works together to figure out how to give somebody the ability to be empowered and to have the voice that they need. But Jane, when when you're talking with families and you're helping them through this process, I could tell you is that I'd be overwhelmed. It's like, I don't even know where to start. I've been told to do this. I've been told to do that. And, and then the next person tells me something completely different. Like that's how our world has been working. So how do you how do you make sure that everybody's talking, communicating? How does that interdisciplinary team start? Because I'd like to bring that into our further discussion of lingo as a, as a system, just to understand how we got there first. Absolutely. This is such a great question, Jeff. I could not agree with you more. The level of overwhelm when you're talking about introducing a system like this. And something that we say at Lingo all the time is teaching an AAC system and teaching communication skills is a marathon and not a sprint. Um, so when you have so many different people at the table who have great expertise and are willing to, to collaborate with each other, I think it's really important to get everyone on the same page and take a look at what's important for the child that's in front of you today. Um, we're all bringing our different areas of expertise and our backgrounds and our experience, um, but first and foremost, every conversation should start around who is the child that we're helping today and what is meaningful for them. Um, and if you start with that and keep that in mind throughout every little or large decision you're making about their communication systems, then that helps give perspective and ensure that the recommendations and the goals are all aligned. If we're always bringing it back to what's the purpose of the strategies or the skills or the recommendations we're putting in place, it all should come back to that individual child and that individual family. Yeah, and I mean, having a voice through the process, whether that's the family or the individual who's actually going to be utilizing the system, I think that giving them the chance to be able to contribute and to be able to be a part of that decision making, um, it's 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 extremely important. Um, now let's let's talk about lingo because uh, I mean, you all must feel really good about your product because if you're able to give somebody a voice. That now creates a whole new world that you can operate in, contribute in, succeed in. Um, so what is what is lingo and, and how does that help to create this voice for the for the and we'll talk about it as a for children with autism right now, but how does that help the autistic child? Sure. Uh, so lingo is an assistive communication technology or an AAC uh, assistive tax system and training solution. Um, for people who have trouble speaking. And Lingo is not just limited for uh, people with autism. Uh, it can be used by uh, people affected by aphasia, like stroke survivors or those with traumatic brain injury. I, well, Lingo itself, it's, there is the technology uh, aspect where we, there is a Lingo learner used by the person who has trouble speaking and Lingo coach uh, used by the communication partner. That could be a parent, a therapist, a teacher, or care partner. And the, look, the coach collects data from the Lingo learner to assess like how they're, or just monitor the progress of how they're communicating independently or with assistance over time so that we can make evidence-informed decisions uh, based on the learners' uh, progress on language and communication and speech as well. Um, so the training aspect, there's a second secondary component to Lingo, and that is the training aspect. So Lingo, Lingo is an ACE provider, so we do provide CEUs to BCBAs and BCABAs. And our training was developed in conjunction with speech language pathologists and board certified behavior analysts. So it takes a real interdisciplinary approach to approaching AAC intervention. The AAC intervention itself is not designed specifically for lingo, but for all AAC systems. So we're taking approaches like how do we pair, introduce an AAC system to a child? Uh, what are the first things that we teach? How do we you what vocabulary do we choose when we're setting up an AAC system and how do we individualize it? Lingo is mainly two aspects, the technology and the training. And you just have a tool, but you need the training uh, to go along with it to make AAC uh, an approach uh, successful. So maybe I'll stick to the technology side first, but on the technology side is that 
over time, some of the challenges that you saw, I mean, and, and assistive technology with communication devices have been about for quite a few years, and it's gotten better over time. And I remember historically is that even just being able to create new words into the system was laborsome. And in order to, and, and you don't want to stunt somebody's ability to communicate because it's hard for you to, to program the device. Um, and then even the categorization, the fluency of language, the ability to build off things, make it more naturalized. So where are lingo on the scale of that? Have they been able to kind of adapt over time with their technology to be able to create a growing voice for the learner and not feel stuck at certain junctures? Yes, so there's so, some unique features inside uh, within Lingo that make it highly customizable for each individual. Uh, Lingo is not a standard template for any learner. It's meant to be uh, customized. It's meant to be expanded upon uh, based on the learner's growth of language. So, um, so one of the things about Lingo is that there's a thing called language trees, and that's programmed on the back end. Um, you know, we can start off with single word nodes or two word, three word connecting word flows. For example, mommy go park or I go park, something like that, or I want to go to the park. You can expand it that way. However, wherever the uh, individual learning um, and language and learning profile is at. So from there, there is that aspect. And then there's also two different displays that allow the learner to communicate um, based on the one, there's like a topic-based uh, approach to communication. So there's communication boards that are sorted according to topic like school or park, uh, whoever you decide to customize it based on the learner's interest and uh, context in daily life. Um, and then there's the free form, which is a simplified uh, grid, um, to call it like a taxonomic grid. That's what in the AC literature, uh, that's how it's described, like a static play. And that's where you can generate novel responses. And then there's quick chat. So that's just your display where you can uh, find words quickly to help prevent communication breakdowns, like help me or my way, please. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I remember over, over years is just seeing the, the language evolve. And for a parent, to be able to sit down and hear my child go from one or two word utterances to start to develop just some naturalization and some fluency in the language. It's like a wow moment. It's, I mean, every step of the way, of course, is a wow moment, but it starts to feel like, hold on, I didn't expect this very natural dialogue to be occurring through it. Um, so Jane, when you're talking to families and, and you've been uh, integral on kind of getting the the behavior analytic component to the technology, I'm sure, is that how does how does that feel for the families? Have they given feedback on, you know, my child can take this around. They're not stunted to only use this in a clinic setting or in a school setting, but their voice travels with them. I mean, what's the feedback you get? Absolutely. I mean, overall, I think the biggest feedback that we've gotten from parents is relief that their child has the skills to be able to advocate for themselves um, when the parent's not there. That's often the, the biggest fear that the parents have is that I understand what they need and, and I can I can almost read their mind, but when they go to school, I'm not sure how they're getting by. Or if I'm if I'm not right there, I'm not sure how they're getting their wants and needs met and um, representing uh, what what they need. Um, so it's that that I would say is the the number one relief that we get from parents is that um, when they're given access to the skills that they need to get their wants and needs met, um, that that relieves the parents. And then the second thing is the social connection component to it. You know, in behavior analytic terms, we talk about labeling and interverbals and conversation skills, um, but for a parent, it's that social connection piece that my child's able to have those back and forth conversations finally because they have been taught the skills in order to do those things. Um, so I would say those are the two biggest standout things uh, that we that we hear from parents. Is there is there ever those moments? Um, I would think that and just looking at my own children's relationships is that when they're not communicating, I'm assuming, I'm guessing, I'm wondering. Is there is there ever those aha moments for the families being, well, I have no idea this is what they really wanted. I've been giving them this this whole time because I totally thought this is what was going to make them happy at the moment. But really, I just learned through giving them access to communication. 
I was wrong. And now I can be better for them by taking away that interdependence and giving them their voice back. Do you ever hear stories like that? Yeah, I actually have a parent um, who is able to like customize a uh, lingo for her son. Um, for example, her son loves vehicles and there's very specific types of vehicles. I, I, they're, it's based on, um, I believe, some, some show and there's characters for each uh, vehicle. And so she's programmed it to include all of her son's favorite characters and is able to have not a generic like toy truck pick, but her son really gets specific as to what he wants. And from there, he gets very, very motivated to communicate. So um, another example would be uh, another, another parent just told me that, you know, going to Tim Hortons is like a famous uh, coffee shop chain. And. Uh, Canada is that, you know, her daughter is able to request very specific types of donuts at Tim Hortons, not a generic donut, but she's being uh, specific with the type she wants and she's able to go and speak to the cashier while using her lingo and order what she wants and make comments and greetings. So just things like that. The parents have been found that, you know, their child doesn't get upset if they don't get their specific thing that they, the specific thing that they want, that they're able to clarify their message a lot more. Yeah, I can imagine behaviorally is that it, it opens brand new doors for the families to actually be able to have these communication and meet the needs for their children better. And I know that lingo isn't just for the the autistic community is that I when every time you're talking about this, I'm thinking about my wife's line of work where she works with dementia care and sometimes stroke victims, things like that. And it's like I couldn't I. I can see the frustration with some of her patients as well. Of like, I'm trying to get this out and I can't. Do, does it have applications beyond uh, age sets and being able to kind of really hit the community at large? Does I mean, is lingo that broad? Um, AAC in general is quite broad. I, I designed it with an, a behavior analytic background. Uh, one thing is that Lingo is funded and partnered with the Center for Aging and Brain Health Innovation in, at Breakcrest Health in, in Toronto. And we had at our early pilot uh, used Lingo with a stroke survivor. He had like just a few words, yes, no, mostly. He was able to say yes, no. And uh, his name is Bobby. It's actually his blog and the stories in the Center for Aging Brain Health Innovation uh, website. And there's a story of him and me. And uh, what I ended up doing was working with him for about uh, three to three or so months. And I would visit him at the hospital and we practice uh, using Lingo, the, the first prototype. And taking similar approaches, obviously, you know, Bobby is a, a girl man. He had language. Uh, but we're teaching him in a way that uh, would one get him accustomed to using the device first because he's never used an iPad before. So we got him comfortable using the iPad, then taught him to find the words like what do you say when you want to order something from Tim Hortons or what do you say when you're thirsty? And he would go and select the words and then eventually he would start saying it as he was pressing the tiles and then he started speaking it independently and then we went and generalized uh, his communication when we actually went to his favorite coffee shop Tim Hortons. Tim Hortons is uh, getting a lot of free advertisement uh, today. <laughs> um, so yeah, so it was applicable for him. Um, he actually ended up learning to have simple spoken conversations again and his affect and his mood improved greatly because, you know, the, his words were coming out. He was, he was able to string a few words together and actually like speak in sentences again. Um, you know, basic comfort and his, his, his relationship with his daughter improved because he was, um, he was, he was talking a bit more. So, um, so that's, that's applicable. I think for dementia, there needs to be some, some research, but there is research on AAC with dementia. I think that we just have to take a look at how lingo would be applicable, especially when it comes to using textual prompts, uh, to, you know, support conversations. And Lego could be applicable for that, for sure. Yeah, and that that's one of my favorite things is that, um, and I, as I talk with uh, behavior analysts and when I talk with the technology world is that we're not necessarily solving an autism uh, diagnostic issue. We're, we're trying to empower communication. We're trying to empower a skill set, which is really what our job is, is that we're empowerment people. <laughs> um, but it, and it goes across domains, it goes across people. and. Um, and maybe this goes into the training side and, and Jane and 
when we're talking about interdisciplinary care, we're talking about trying to connect people who have been speaking different technology languages and different professional languages and getting them all on the same page to be patient centered or client centered or and focus on you know what what the issue is, what we're solving. So how does your training make sure that it can touch parents, behavior analysts, speech pathologists, teachers, community members, and interested party? Like how does it hit everybody? That's such a great question. And you know, the easy solution would be if we could wave a magic wand and have everyone start right out from the same page. Um, but I think it really goes back to everyone being in agreement on what your role is on that multidisciplinary team. If there is a case manager or if there is um, someone who's taking a lead in uh, guiding the case and uh, guiding the skills that are being developed. Um, but the way that Lingo is addressing the training is looking at each individual as a unique learner and bringing the skills in that you're teaching based on what the current assessment is showing and then starting on very specific skills and goals that again are, are meaningful for that individual and are going to bring them closer to uh, what their goals are. Um, so there are different levels of training that Lingo provides um, to be reflective of what the needs are. Um, so at the very basic level, um, Lingo has uh, created an introductory course and it was created by uh, BCBA and SLP professionals, as well as a communication disorder assistant. And uh, that training is really meant to bring everyone on that, that same page. And it, it goes into, you know, um, using the science of behavior analysis, which is the science of teaching and learning. Um, how can we use behavior analysis to get that assessment and understand where our where step one is and what are our very first goals and what are the very first pieces of vocabulary that we're going to introduce um, and then get right into action. Let's teach those very first skills together. Um, so that introductory course is very much a great foot in the door for teams to all get on the same page together. Um, and something that you know, we've really talked about at Lingo is the, the parent and the caregiver and the family members are that most important voice in the room. Um, so rather than having all of the professionals take the training, there's been a course that's mirrored for parents um, and for caregivers to, to take that and, and get that same education and information and knowledge. Um, and then the application exercises that have been embedded within the training. Um, so it gives parents and caregivers in language that can be understood, um, breaking things down um, in, in ways that you know, you, you're not requiring uh, years of clinical experience to implement. You're able to go into your kitchen and say, okay, what's a daily routine? that makes sense for my family? How can I start out and introduce the system? Um, so there's that parent caregiver side to it, as well as the professionals. And again, that's just the introductory level. Uh, but from there, Lingo is offering that individualized consultation, training and support. And uh, it can be, again, flexible depending on what the needs are. So whether that's a small ABA clinic um, who's consulting out to schools or whether that's a large uh, multi-level association or organization uh, that has 100 different clinics across uh, the US or across North America. Um, so rather than taking a one size fits all approach, starting out with an introduction and then breaking out into supports that target what the individual wants to target. The way that you're breaking down those artificial barriers, I think is so important is that there shouldn't be real rifts between different service delivery types or different professional groups. And, and unfortunately, there sometimes are and you have to navigate it. But the, the way that you're working with the families, I would I would personally recommend that all clinicians listen to the family side as well, because that's what they're going to be hearing. Like as much as we want to profess our knowledge set and utilize our terms and really show that we're the professional in the room, it's, you know, the family's going to hear what the family's going to hear. And I love the fact that you have that training going out that way. I just encourage uh, the professional class to say, go listen to that as well, because I think it would help. But um, so when when you're doing these CU events and trying to empower, uh, and maybe we'll talk about the behavior analyst community on this. Um, where where are the gaps? Where are behavior analysts not quite understanding how to use AAC appropriately all the time? And where are the areas where it's like, this is a no brainer. These two things fit so well together 
that we need to be pulling off of these fields and making them even more immersed in one another. And maybe I'll start with you, Ling, and, and Jane, you can you can follow up with some ideas as well. You know, although with a majority of the the clients that we work that are autistic and a lot of them, you know, are not speaking, um, require use of AAC. Infor like, unfortunately, there is no uh, mandatory training on AAC implementation for BCBAs. Um, so, so there, there obviously needs to be a change in uh, our industry and in the requirements of practicing when working with autistic individuals um, to serve them best. An area of a lack within the BCBA profession is understanding of language development um, and that uh, we need to be collaborating and working with speech language pathologists and understanding what language development looks like in a typically developing child, but also uh, looking at how that applies to the children and the adults that we're working with. So those are two big areas uh, in which BCBAs or the, uh, the ABA profession can really benefit from. Um, now, that being said, you know, Linko does pull a lot of research um, in the SLP lit literature, like Journal of AAC, and to to discuss around discuss like in terms of like what implementation AAC features can be beneficial for the autistic population, um, and looking at and pulling out the research from. Uh, speech language pathologists that have uh, worked on this. So one of those things we need to, I think, as a field, we need to improve in this area. You know, Lingo is still uh, learning and growing as the research research comes out, and we we do as much, the best that we can to pull from the most recent research and share it with our our peer group. Yeah, and Jane, do you have thoughts? Definitely. I would say one of the most common, I guess, kind of light bulb moments that we see behavior analysts um, or behavioral clinicians coming out with during these trainings is that AEC is not a manding machine. Um, it's not a it's not a, a system that's just used solely for requesting. Um, and I think that it, it the confusion comes because requesting and getting your immediate wants and needs met is absolutely the first step when you're introducing language and the power of communication, but it's just that first step you need to go beyond that and expand across the verbal operants or across the other ways that we communicate. Um, and with autistic individuals, it's highly likely or um, a lot of people experience autism where there's that reduced sensitivity to social stimuli as reinforcers or um, they, they don't have as much enjoyment out of social um, experiences initially some of the time. Um, so it's it's difficult for clinicians to teach these other skills beyond um, beyond requesting uh, because they, they don't know how. And uh, to go back to what Ling said, it's often not taught in graduate programs. It's not a mandatory requirement um, in your BCBA supervision experience. Um, so a lot of the times clinicians are left to their own devices to try to figure this out. And, you know, the research is really reflective of that. If you take a look in Java or any of the journals, you're going to see um, an oversaturation in one word requesting um, how to teach that and the effectiveness of that. But if you look at, you know, how to teach a two component tact or a two component label or a, a noun verb combination, um, it's, it's harder to find something like that. Um, and, you know, we're talking about things that are just the beginning of language. So when you start to look at complex adult forms of language, you could see where people get lost. Um, so that's what we're really trying to teach at Lingo is that um, AEC is a total uh, full system for communication, not just requesting. Requesting is step one. Yeah, and and quite frankly, it, I guess I'll, I'll claim ignorance. I totally didn't realize that in the education system for BCBAs and in the master's programs is that they're not tackling this, um, which puts the onus on organizations as well right now is that it's tougher to change an entire education system. But what you can do is change organizations. And it sounds like the CEU opportunities that you all are providing and then the additional training fit that bubble really well in being able to help clinicians to be able to utilize the systems better and more efficiently and to be able to expand on how they use it to make sure they're getting the full functionality. Um, What's what's your advice for families on this? Because and we've talked about patients. We've talked about the fact that there is no magic wand and all of a sudden you get an AAC device. Now I can talk. Like, 
What are you telling families about, you know, this is a journey and how do you help prepare them so that they don't give up on a technology that maybe they had expectations that were not necessarily in line with reality at the moment? There's no like data or research to support um, this, but I personally think like it's 80% training and 20% tech and don't get married to the tech. You know, uh, technology is always evolving and changing. The current system designs that we see now on, you know, the traditional grid style systems were based on the designs from the 1980s and 1990s. They're just put on 21st century technology. This, this is all going to change. Like technology is rapidly changing. Uh, what's important to really look at the, the person in front of you, their language and learning profile, where they're at right now and how we can help them reach their full potential. And a lot of it has to do with the training that is being provided for them and how do we implement it and use data to guide how they're progress progressing through the language. They may be on picture symbols uh, for one, one, like six months, and then they may be trans transitioning to using sight words next. And then how do we build literacy skills? So really it's about really being married to the teaching process. You know, that's and that's where I would start there. Not to be so hung up on the technology, but really be married to the teaching and taking evidence based approaches to teaching language and, and uh, literacy or speech. Yeah, I mean, would it, would it be safe to say is that you're you're utilizing the technology as a vehicle to access the, the concepts, to access the, the actual procedures that are in place? Um, it's a wonderful vehicle, um, and the easier you make that vehicle and the, the way that you make it adaptable over time is really what's going to make it so that it takes off and allows somebody to get the full ability that they have within them to explore communication easier. So what is it about lingo that that stands out? I mean, if you were if you were to give me three, four things that, you know, lingo is actually they're they're helping to guide the field in certain ways. Where where would you be saying that lingo is doing that well and helping families the most? So the one is that uh, lingo's display is a little bit more intuitive. Um, I would say it's a bit more intuitive because it's there's three displays. One is a schematic design, which is, you know, language organized according to context. The vocabulary is uh, organized according to the topic. So this is just a lot more easier for the individual not to navigate. The use of language trees. So, you know, someone is at a 12 to 18 month level in terms of their language development. We're not going to be using uh, expecting them to to use full sentences. We're going to start off with um, at least 50 of the most meaningful and functional words for that individual, and it'll be organized in a way that help, it's easy for them to access. There are two unique features called transition to text and transition to speak. Um, both features are based in the, uh, the research, AAC literature. Um, so uh, essentially the transition to text helps uh, the learner transition from use of pictures to sight words by systematically fading the pictures over time so the learner responds to the sight word alone and uses text to communicate um, so moving from pictures uh, to text uh, sight word uh, development and then the transition to speak which uses a time delay uh, on certain words uh, so that gives the opportunity for that learner to say the word on their own and the biggest one will be the data collection, my favorite, the data collection piece. So every time a learner says something, you can, it gets sent over to coach uh, if you're activated in a session and you can um, mark the data, whether it's independent, whether you used a physical prompt or use it aided language modeling, um, and then uh, mod like evaluate how they're learning across uh, different um, uh, prompt, prompts provided or if there were no prompts provided. So you can really just, take a look at your teaching style and seeing if this is uh, the best way to teach your learner to communicate. All of those sound like wonderful features. And I mean, it, it definitely is blending the speech communication world and the behavior analytic world. And it's helping to kind of make sure that we're in lockstep as we move forward. Um, and and Jane, you, you've done a lot of the interdisciplinary work. And I know that just even putting something out there and having this product available, is going to bring about interest. Um, 
where where can people from all walks of professions and all walks of life start to gain access to lingo? I mean, is there is are you all doing more trainings? Are you doing speaking events? Is there uh, a website they should be looking for to be able to get this information? Absolutely. I would say the first thing to check out is the website. You can use the website to learn more about the features, create your Lingo Learner account and your Lingo Coach account um, and get some information on the training. So um, I'm sure you'll put it in the show notes, but that's uh, www.lingo.com with two G's. Um, and we also love to connect with clinicians and with parents who are using the software. Um, so we definitely invite you to send us an email um, to, uh, to learn more about specific trainings that will be in your area um, or the online training library that's available. So that would be uh, an email address to info at lingo.com. And again, I'm sure we can put those in the show notes, but um, I'm glad you asked Jeff because we'll, we're all, we're actually taking a lingo trip uh, to Colorado to do some in-person trainings um, and that'll be in the month of May. Um, so if there's any uh, parents or clinicians who are interested in live training, uh, that would be uh, the best time to reach us. That sounds wonderful. And I suggest that people take up this, this offer is that um, being able to start talking with somebody, bring in some trainers into your organization, being able to really empower. When I think about one of the most important things to give somebody the way to be able to engage with all and establish relationships and have a meaningful life, it's communication. And communication can take a variety of different paths. But we have to be trained to be able to help somebody to evolve their system of communication to really do the work we need to. Um, Ling, is there anything else that, that you would like to add as far as just different things that we that we should be aware of for Lingo coming up? Um, well, we have our online uh, course. Uh, and this is an asynchronous, like so parents uh, and professionals can take it on on their own time. It's about six hours long. It's called Introduction to AAC for Children with Autism. Um, it's for CEUs, for BCBAs and BCABAs, and it's uh, the parents who have taken it um, have found it very helpful to learn and, and they've implemented it with their own child as well, like the taking the the learnings from that and uh, we also host events um, for BCBAs uh, at least once every quarter um, online trainings called the 2CEU event. It's uh, using the AC to enhance verbal behavior programs for children with autism. Perfect. I think that um, we'll definitely be able to add the links and to make sure that everybody knows where to access these um, wonderful resources. And I appreciate you both coming on today to talk about lingo and also to talk about the value of AAC and interdisciplinary care. And hopefully we can continue this dialogue as, as time goes on because it's, it's a moving target. And the more that we can engage the community and bring more people into it is that we're making a voice louder and you're trying to be able to do that for each of our clients and patients out there. So I appreciate your work. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks for having us on. Thanks for all that you do at ABS Kids. Thank you for listening to Autism Weekly. We hope you tune back in next week to learn more about autism in the real world. Autism Weekly is now found on all the major listening apps, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Amazon Music, and more. Subscribe to be notified when we post a new podcast. Autism Weekly is produced by ABS Kids. ABS Kids is proud to provide diagnostic assessments and ABA therapy to children with developmental delays like autism spectrum disorder. You can learn more about ABS Kids and the Autism Weekly podcast by visiting ABS Kids. Dot com. Thanks for tuning in. See you again next week.